Good morning. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church here at 108 East Central Boulevard in Kiwani. For those of you who are at home, now you know where we are, so we'd love to see you come and visit us any Sunday morning. Also, Saturday evenings, we have worship from at 5.30 to 6.30, and we would welcome you to come to that as well. And the worship on Saturday is in our chapel. My name is Donna Boardman. I'm the lay leader here at this congregation, and Reverend Paul Copeland is our pastor. He'll be leading our worship today. We'd like to welcome the friends that are joining us. We hope that you'll take some time after worship to go downstairs and have some refreshments and cookies. We always have good food available for you and also good fellowship. It's wonderful to be able to talk to our friends and neighbors. Uh, next Sunday, I have, I have a few announcements here. It is Girl Scout Sunday. That'll be March 8th. And so how many Girl Scouts do we have here? Have any here today? Well, I'm sure that there's a lot in our congregation and a lot that uh, are part of our troops here. And so we ask that all the current and former Brownies and Girl Scouts are invited to wear their uniforms or sash to worship. So please remember to do that. We have confirmation classes coming up. I can't believe it's gone so fast. It's been a year already. That will begin next Sunday as well. 11.30 to 1 p.m. in Dorcas Parlor. Uh, the March issue of the Circuit Rider has been printed and is available throughout the building and at the various doors, so please pick that up today if you've not gotten yours already. And our custodian, Rich Kohler, is going to be retiring April 3rd, lucky boy, and applications are available on the table across the hall from the church office for a new custodian. So if you're interested in something like that or you know someone, please come in and pick up an application and fill it out and turn it in and we'll review that for you. We also have an announcement from the M&Ms. They wanted to say thank you to everyone who attended their dinner on Friday. They said that it was a huge success. We'd appreciate anyone who donated in any way to uh, just say thank you to them. And we do have delicious soups on sale. Well, actually, I heard that the soup is gone, and all that's left is chili. So they said they have chili on sale today in Fellowship Hall after worship for $4. And they also have single servings of pie. Anybody out there like pie? Oh, uh, yeah, afraid so. <laughs> Well, they got lots of pie left, too, and I think lemonade as well, so, and iced tea, right, Joe? Yep, but it was a huge success, and we thank all of you who helped out in any way, whether you donated or, or helped to work, and it was a very wonderful cause because the M&Ms did that for Relay for Life. We also will be having a youth group mission trip coming up, so they're trying to raise money for that. If any of you are interested, we have... Um, college teams pasta and Easter pasta and baseball pasta and support our troops pasta and breast cancer pasta and pets and golf and happy birthday pasta. Well, you name it. They got all kinds of pasta. <laughs> and you know what the really good thing about that is? You don't have to cook much. You just kind of put it in the water and it cooks itself and it's already got the seasoning in there. So you just have, see, it's easy for supper. So be sure to pick up some pasta from the kids and uh, that's going to support their youth trip, their mission trip, and that will be on sale through March 10th. So please contact uh, Lisa Hasse or anyone from the youth group for those. I, sometimes they sell them downstairs, so watch in case they have them down there. Are there any other announcements this morning? Okay, are you ready to worship? God bless you. Let's get started.
Let us pray. <coughs> Eternal and gracious God, some of us come here today excited and looking forward to worship, and some of us come as though we had to drag ourselves here. We may be physically, emotionally tired, we may be spiritually drained, but we've come because we always come. <coughs> God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this day, whether we come excited or whether we come somewhat drained. Renew our lives, recharge our spiritual batteries, refresh us, fill our cups, O oh Lord. Fill them up as we lift them up unto you. May your promise that our cup runneth over be true this day and every day. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate this day. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of celebration this morning is number 111, How Can We Name a Love? Please stand as you're able and join in singing. <coughs> of faith this morning is found on page 881 as we read together the Apostles Creed page 881 where the Spirit of the Lord is there is the one true church apostolic and universal whose holy faith let us now declare <coughs> I believe in, in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty maker, maker of, of heaven and earth and, earth, and in, in Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son our, our Lord who was, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take a few moments to greet those around you. As you're being seated, please turn to him number 415, Take Up Thy Cross. <clears throat> Take up thy cross. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. 
As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This was why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life, for our justification. And then our gospel lesson comes from the 8th chapter of Mark, verses 31 through 38. Jesus then began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." This is the word of God for the people of God. God. It's time for the children to come forward for the children's message, and we'll be singing 405, Seek Ye First. Okay. (coughs) Seek ye first the Now, you didn't leave me any place to sit. Can you two girls move so I can sit down? Thanks. I forgot to bring candy in, so I had to go to my office and get candy. Not that any of you probably like candy. (laughs) So, I had to go get candy. I read... um, something today that a gentleman named uh, Michael Lanway wrote, and I thought it was so good that I'm just going to read it to you just the way he wrote it. So, um, wait a minute, that's not the story I was wanting to read. Forgiving others, Michael Lanway. Here we go. Huh. 
Do any of you know what forgiveness means? What does forgiveness mean? You forgot. Well, we'll forgive you for having forgotten. Anybody else? What's forgiveness mean? Kevin? Apologize. Apologize? Well, you can apologize and say that you're sorry, but the other person is the one who actually does the forgiving, right? Yeah. Anybody else want to try about what forgiveness is? Yes? When they say that you're sorry, you forgive them. Have you learned in school that when you define a word, you're not supposed to use that word in the definition? We get help from the teacher. <laughs> you get help from the teacher. So I guess you're expecting help from me? Yes. Well, too bad. <laughs> well, Michael Lanyard says, I want to tell you a story that will tell us what forgiveness means. One day when I was eight, about eight years old, I was alone in the house. I went into my daddy's bedroom and saw two quarters on the dresser. I looked at them for a long time, then I touched them. I threw them up in the air for a while. Those quarters sure looked good to me. I wanted them so badly that I decided I would take them. I put them in my pocket and went to the store and bought some candy. I got back home and I began to get scared. I just knew my daddy would find out that I took his money. I got so scared I went to my room and hid under my bed. Then my daddy came home. He said, where are you? I said, I am in my bedroom. He said, well, come out here. I went out to the living room and he said, so tell me, what did you do today? Immediately I thought he knew I took those quarters. So I confessed. I said, daddy, I took your quarters. He said, why did you do that? I started to cry, and I said, I don't know, but I am sorry. My daddy looked at me, and he said, I want you to know that I'm very disappointed in you. Then do you know what he did? He put his arm around me and said, you did something wrong, but I still love you. I forgive you. Now, one of the reasons that this story kind of caught my eye this morning as I read it, it was when I was about eight years old, I took some quarters out of my mom and dad's change container. So it sounded a lot like what happened with me. Except in my case, I'm not sure my parents ever found out about it. I guess after uh, all these years, I could confess to my mom, couldn't I? And ask for her to forgive me for taking a quarter or two quarters out of her change container back then. But anyway, anyway, Michael (laughs) Land writes, that's what forgiveness means. To be able to say, I did something wrong, you did something wrong to me, but I still love you, I forgive you. We need to say that when our friends do something wrong, when our family does something wrong. That's what Jesus wants us to do, to say, I still love you, I forgive you, when someone does something wrong to you. Now, do you know why we can forgive somebody else? Because of God. Because God has forgiven us. For everything we've ever done that was wrong or bad or we know we shouldn't have done it. or For everything we ever do, God is always ready to forgive us. And today as we take communion, we'll be reminded that Jesus died on the cross to show us the depths of God's love and the depths of God's forgiveness and the depths of God's mercy. Now in our church... We let parents pretty much decide when their children are ready to take communion. That's not a decision I make. That's not a decision the congregation makes. That's kind of a decision between you and your parents about, am I ready to take communion? Now, I don't know anybody who really understands everything about communion. I don't, ever, I don't understand everything about it. It's still somewhat of a mystery to me. How we can eat a piece of bread and take a little bit of grape juice and somehow it it tells us about God's love and mercy and forgiveness and stuff. So when you guys come up and take communion, those of you who may do that already, and uh, you don't understand everything that's going on, that's okay. Because even the adults don't understand everything that's going on. But the main thing is to remember that in this sacrament that we call communion, we are shown once again the love 
and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. And because God always is ready to forgive us and is willing to forgive us for anything that we've ever done in life, that makes it possible for us to forgive others. And it also makes it possible for us, when we've hurt somebody else, to tell them we're sorry so that they can forgive us. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for this day and for this opportunity that we have to be gathered together here in this place. We thank you for these children especially as we are reminded the words of Jesus, let the children come unto me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Thank you for your mercy, thank you for your love, thank you for your forgiveness you have shown us in Jesus. Help each of us to grow in our ability to confess our sin. Help each of us to grow in our ability to forgive others. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, since I went and got candy, I guess I might as well give you some candy, hadn't I? Now, I think I've got two or three different kinds. We'll see what we we got here. So, um, and you get one piece of candy. Okay. You want one of them? Okay, just reach in there. I got a few of these, and I've got a few little Hershey bars, too. You don't want the dark chocolate? Please join in singing the first verse. Don't step on anybody as you're leaving.
Our scripture passages this morning kind of point out the paradox of our Protestant theology. In the book of Romans, we read about how Abraham was justified for his belief. He believed God and it was reckoned to him, it was counted to him as righteousness. In that fourth chapter of Romans, Paul reminds us that we are saved not because of our works, not because of our efforts, but we are saved because what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and we believe on that in faith. By grace have you been saved, not by your own works, lest anyone should boast. So on the one hand, we have our Protestant doctrine of salvation strictly by grace. And yet when we look at the gospel lesson, it seems to point us to the fact that we have work to do. If anyone would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Forever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Some of you may remember that during the season of Lent, in the background of our scripture passages, is the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And in the gospel of Luke, when it tells the story about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, it starts out like this. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. On the one hand, we and I are saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Don't lose sight of that. And on the other hand, because we are saved, you and I are called to allow the work of God to move in our lives in such a way that we are changed, we are transformed. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. But then he goes on to say, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You and I are not saved by our good works. You and I are not saved and given salvation because we are good people. You and I are given our salvation because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and for me. But having received Jesus Christ into our lives as Savior and as Lord, we commit ourselves to grow into His likeness. We commit ourselves to working out our salvation using spiritual disciplines. As we talk about change, as we talk about transformation of our lives, it is important that we remember in the Gospel of Luke that it was while Jesus was praying that he was transfigured, that his countenance was changed. While he was praying. Praying is one spiritual discipline. It is one of several. I'm not going to talk about all of them this morning. But it is one of several spiritual disciplines. Ways in which we open ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Last fall at our charge conference, in fact, in all of the, at all of the charge conferences in our district, Mary Catherine Pierce, our district superintendent, had us include in the charge conference packet a list of 21 questions that John Wesley, an early Methodist, used to take kind of account of their lives. One of the questions was, am I enjoying 
prayer? Am I enjoying prayer? I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I've ever thought about enjoying prayer or not. But as you think about it, are you enjoying prayer? Are you, do you delight in speaking with God the Father in the same way that you delight talking with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your children or your parent or whatever other human relationship that you might have? Do you delight in talking with God? The same way in which you delight in human conversations that you have. That's kind of the import of that. Are you enjoying prayer? Now oftentimes we will look at the passages where it talks about Jesus praying. And there are several passages in the Gospels where it says that Jesus left the people and he went off to pray. In fact, there's a couple of instances where it says Jesus arose early in the morning while it was still dark. And he went off by himself in order to pray. And people will say, well, if I was Jesus, I could do that. And my response is, if Jesus needed to do that, how much more so do we need to do that? Find time where it's just God and me. And spend some time talking with God. And listening to God. One of the other spiritual disciplines is reading the Bible. And I encourage people to read the Bible every day. I make it a goal to read the Bible every day. I don't always meet that goal, but that's one of my goals in life is every day read the Bible. Well, there's some also some questions that related to uh, reading the Bible in Wesley's small group questions that we were given last fall at charge conference time. One of the questions is, did the Bible live in me today? And the other question was, do I give the Bible time to speak to me every day? And I would almost say that those questions are really backwards. I just wrote them down the way they appeared on the sheets that we have, but they really ought to be turned around. Because really, if you don't give the Bible time to speak to you every day, The Bible's probably not going to live in you every day. So in order to answer the first question, did the Bible live in you today? Affirmatively, we're going to have to answer the second question affirmatively first of all. Spiritual disciplines. Gathering together every week to worship. Taking advantage of the sacrament of communion when it's available to us. Being in Christian fellowship with other people. Some of you may be practicing one of the spiritual disciplines this Lenten season by fasting of some kind or another. But in order for us to be transformed, to be changed, to be in the, in the very likeness of Jesus Christ, you and I are called to live and practice spiritual disciplines. And those spiritual disciplines may very well be one of the crosses that we have to bear in life. Some people have said to me over the years, well, I just, I just, I just can't get into reading the Bible. And I say to them, well, do you read the newspaper every day? Some people I know, they make a point of reading the newspaper every day. And I gotta confess, even in those days that I don't read my Bible every day, I, almost, I hardly ever miss reading the daily paper, Tuesday through Saturday. And I know some people who not only get the local paper, they get paper out of Peoria, they get the Quad Cities paper, they may get the uh, journal out of New York, and they read several papers a day, but they just can't seem to find it in themselves to read the Bible. And that may be a cross that we have to bear. That may be a decision that we have to make. That I may not understand everything that I read and I would encourage you to start with the New Testament. Don't start with Genesis. Start in the New Testament. Don't start with the Gospel of John. It's hard. Start with Matthew or Mark or something like that. 
And there'll still be parts you don't understand. There's lots of parts, especially in the Old Testament, I don't understand. And if you don't know the history, you won't understand parts of the Old Testament either. But you may have to just make a decision that I'm going to spend 10 minutes a day reading the Bible, whether it's a chapter or two chapters or three chapters, reading the Bible every day and allowing it to feed my spirit. You may have to make a decision that you're going to pray every day, that you're going to spend some quality time, you and God, talking with one another in order for you to be changed in order for you to be transformed. Another spiritual discipline that's really not normally kind of included with spiritual disciplines is family devotions. Family devotions. How many of you spend time with your children, particularly if you have children still living at home, praying with them, reading the Bible together with them, Perhaps reading through the sanctuary for Lent with them or some other daily devotional. How many of us spend time as families nurturing one another in our spiritual life? Parents are the largest factor in whether youth remain religiously active as young adults, according to the National Study of Youth and Religion. I've read this statistic Uh, a couple of different times in recent years. When parents talked about faith at home, were active in their congregations, and attached great significance to their faith, 82% of their children were highly religious in their mid to late 20s. Parents, if you have children still living at home, and even if you have children who aren't living at home, How you express your faith and how you live out your faith has a great impact upon whether or not your children are going to live out that same faith. Parents are the largest factor, the largest factor. Not the preacher, not the Sunday school teacher, not the youth leader. Parents are the largest factor in whether youth remain religiously active as young adults. And I encourage us parents to make sure that we are nurturing our children at home and not just bringing them to church and expecting the Sunday school class to do all of the work for us. Because you spend a whole lot more time with your children in that one hour in Sunday school, in that one hour in worship. And the impact that you can have on their lives is much greater than the impact that the rest of the congregation can have. Congregation's impact is important, but your impact is far greater. Finally, Tony Campolo wrote that the whole purpose of a devotional life is to grow into what Christ wants us to be. This means to be so much into Him and to have Him so much into us that we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. Once again, we are reminded that salvation is given to us as a gift because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But to be disciples of Jesus Christ means that we take up our cross daily and follow after him. Even if that means that we make decisions, that we are going to pray, that we're going to read our Bible, that we're going to share our faith with our children, that we're going to nurture our lives as Jesus nurtured his life in prayer and was transfigured in glory and in honor. Amen. Let us pray. Our communion prayers this morning come from the book of worship. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, 
who of thy tender mercy didst give your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by the one offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, we most humbly ask you, and grant that we, receiving these, your creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his passion, death, and resurrection, may be partakers of the divine nature through him. When the same night that his betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant, therefore, gracious Lord, so to partake of the sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in newness of life, may grow into his likeness, and may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Would my assistants please come forward?
Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, we, your humble servants, desire your fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and thy whole church may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice unto you, humbly beseeching that all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And although we be unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto you any sacrifice, yet we ask you to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Draw near this day, O God, to those who are brokenhearted, to the lonely, to those who are ailing physically, emotionally, and spiritually, for those who have lost loved ones in death and are filled with grief and sadness and sorrow, for people who are homeless and have inadequate shelter, for those who are hungry, for those who are thirsty. For those who are without families and friends, strengthen, sustain, and undergird each of their lives in your grace and in your love. And may your spirit work in their spirits in such a way that they may come to trust and to know your great love in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit... All honor and glory be unto you, O Father Almighty, world without end, even as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending is number 640, Take Our Bread. Please stand as you're able and join in singing. Take our breath. 